Welcome to Biohacking with Brittany. Thank you for tuning in this week to another episode. I am thrilled to have you here listening. And this is a place where I talk about health and wellness and optimizing those, especially for women and just biohacking in my own health journey in general. I just got back from taking time off and I was in Tofino and Euclid in Vancouver on Vancouver Island. And this is just outside of Vancouver in Canada. And it was phenomenal. So I had the best time. I was able to really just unplug and be away from my computer and my phone and enjoy so much needed time off with my dog and my husband. And yeah, it was great. It was just a really, really special time. And yeah, I, to be honest, I did do some work while I was there. I did my rebranding photo shoot, which I'm really excited about. So I booked this Airbnb that has a sauna and a cold plunge and this beautiful white kitchen in Euclid. And we did this like massive photo shoot for the day and it was a lot of fun. And so I'm really excited to be rebranding for the fall and bringing you a new website as well as like new everything, like social media, you know, everything, everything is just a little outdated. So I'm excited to really be rebranding and be at that point now, which is a big deal. So I'm actually opening up my practice again. And I've been thinking a lot about this. I've been thinking about the next step in my business and what I want to do. And for those who are new, who are listening, I am a nutritionist by trade. I started my Instagram account five years ago, four or five years ago, and it's grown to like multiple platforms and then the podcast and the blog and the website. And then I was seeing clients for a while and I work with a lot of brands and do all sorts of things. And I wanted to create a preconception health program. But then I kind of thought, okay, what if actually before I create some sort of program, I actually start working with clients one-on-one again? And then I was like, okay, maybe this makes more sense. So that's what I've decided I'm doing. I'm opening up my practice again. I actually haven't seen clients in a while, probably since 2021. I was seeing clients and then I took a break from it because I needed time to think about how I really wanted to do it optimally. So that's what I'm working on now. And I'm excited about it because I know more now about what I want to be able to provide women. So my practice will specialize in women's health as a lot of my content and platform already does. And basically from menstruation to motherhood to menopause. And it's all about how can we optimize these times in our life? How can we balance our hormones? How can we have a healthier menstrual cycle? How can we have optimized fertility and postpartum? How can we show up for ourselves 100% as a mom and for our kids, that type of thing as well? And then into menopause, like how can we really go through that transition as well in managing the symptoms that come with that, with perimenopause and menopause? And so that's what I really want to create is I want to create a place where I can help women one-on-one and really just support them during those times because it's so difficult and there's so much misinformation about their, about that. And so I'm really just looking to do that. And yeah, I'm excited to build out a client program again, one-on-one. And then eventually like maybe there'll be a bigger program, an automated type of thing. But I think for now, I'd like to do that. I'd like to sink my teeth into a f- some clients and really just help them. And there's a wait list for my clients right now on my website. If you want to join it, feel free. I will be contacting those people first, for sure, for working together. Absolutely. And I'm roughly figuring it out right now, but I really want to... I just kind of think of like, what would I want, right? What If I was going to go to somebody and be like, hey, can you optimize my health from a female perspective? What would I want? And I would want, first of all, like one-on-one support, I think is so important, whether it's weekly or biweekly check-ins type of idea. I 
definitely would want like all of the health tests. So I'm looking into that. Like, what can I include? Like, how can we have your vitamin, mineral and hormones tested, get your gut tested with like Viome or someone like that. And then obviously supplements as well. And so I'm really brainstorming about how to do this of, is it, I see what your results are and I give you these personal supplement recommendations and I create your personal box of supplements and you get it every single month and I send it to you type of thing. Kind of like Brittany's box gets delivered to you and that covers everything that you need every single month. That's kind of what I'm thinking because I know that if I was going to sign up for a service like this, I would want it to be one and done. I would not want to go and order this supplement from this website and order this test from that and blah, blah, blah. Like I would just want to be like, okay, I'm paying this one price every single month and X, Y, and Z is done for me and great minimum three months. Okay, let's go. That's what I would want to do. And so that's kind of what I'm creating and thinking about what that could look like. And in addition to that, I also want there to be a lot of really fun stuff included. Like, handouts, (laughs) handouts, <laughs> which you typically don't sound fun, but I think like I would love for a handout of like how to track your menstrual cycle, what are my symptoms today, what am I dealing with, or fertility depends where you are in your cycle or in your health journey. And all of these like pain points that we have and creating handouts for that. So how to shop at the grocery store, what healthy groceries to get, how to know what produce is in season and what to buy organic and not organic. And there's so many things. So I just want to create a ton of resources for women to be able to print out at home so that they have it. You know what I mean? Like you don't have to go on a Google or go on to freaking chat GBT to find it. So that's what I'm working on and that's coming. You can go to my website and go and sign up for the wait list if you want or don't, it doesn't matter to me, but just keep an eye out for that. The other thing, like, I guess, since we're speaking about this, that I'm really excited about is my birthday giveaway that I'm doing is coming up very soon. I'm looking at the dates. It comes starting in, oh my gosh. Oh, it's actually really soon. It starts in 11 days. Wow. So I am doing a massive biohacking Britney's birthday giveaway. It's over the course of two days And this is going to be huge. So it's actually, I just wrote it out. The prize is split into two days. So day one and day two, the total prize is over $4,500 worth. So each day is about 22, let's say 2,200 US. And you can enter both days, obviously. And this is like really, really big. So this is bigger than the giveaway I did at Christmas. And I'm really excited for some of the brands involved with this. So The way that I'm doing it this time is you have to enter on the link on the website, which will be coming soon. There's not going to be posts every day about it. There will be on the first two days. And then there's going to be a bunch of podcast episodes and newsletters that go out about every brand. And I'm really hoping to get a lot of people excited about it because it's a really, really big giveaway. Like I said, so, and there's only one winner for each day. (laughs) but there's different things you can do to increase how many times you can enter, which is exciting. So that is also coming and stay tuned for that. So if you are into any type of biohacking or wellness or health, you're definitely going to want to enter. Like I, there's red light therapy involved. There's blue blocking glasses. There's different supplements. There's, oh my gosh, I don't even know. Oh wait, all of it's beside me actually. Let me take a look. Oh, there's like glycanage involved, Viome, which is a gut test. Glycanage takes a look at your biological age is involved. Spermidine life, neurohacker, silver biotics. There's different skincare, like all of these things I'm telling you. And you know what? I'm actually sending the prize boxes to the two winners. So that's going to be really cute. I'm going to send them a little note. I'm going to make it super pretty. And so I really suggest you enter. And that's for anybody. Like they are not female health focused. It's for you, anyone in your family, and it's really exciting. And I think it's going to do really well because I don't really see giveaways this big that happen in the biohacking space, especially when it's all in one, right? Like not just like one product, 
like each day you can win six different products. So anyway, super exciting. Look out for that last week of August for my birthday. My birthday's in September, but I'm doing it early. So get ready for that. And like I said, I just got back from vacation. And one of the things that I took with me was AG1. I actually have their vitamin D3 and D2 sitting right in front of me. This is really important. I think a lot of people know this now, but you really want to be taking vitamin D3 and K2 together because it helps the vitamin D3 be absorbed better in the body. So AG1 does a really good job of this. Their ratio, let me read it to you, is 1,000 IUs of vitamin D3 for every 100 MCGs of vitamin K2, which is a really great ratio. So this is what I take. I take, even in the summer, I do five drops. So I do 5,000 IUs a day in the summer. In the winter, I double it to 10,000. And this is pivotal for my health. And I've been doing this for a long time. So I like this one. I recommend it. You can definitely check it out on my website. I have a discount code with with AG1, which is Biohacking Brittany in, or AG Athletic Greens, yeah, which is Biohacking Brittany in all capitals, and it's linked on my website. And a shout out to Prolon. Again, when I went to Tofino, I took their fasting bars with me. It was great on the go. I, you know, we woke up really early. I caught the 5 15 a.m. ferry, which meant I woke up at 3 a.m. And so you better believe that morning, my diet was water, black coffee, and a prolonged fasting bar. So they're fantastic. And the best part about them is that they actually taste good. They don't taste like these like artificial bars that we get so often now, especially like the crappy keto ones. No, these prolonged fasting bars are my favorite. I would really suggest ordering the box that has the different flavors in it because then you can try all three. That's what I have. I've actually run out and after this trip and I'm going to email them to get some more or just order more myself because I think that's really important. And a shout out to Bioptimizers. I also took their stuff with me. I took their digestive enzymes with me. And you know what? Speaking of, I actually haven't talked about this on the podcast yet. I got food poisoning last week. I put this on my Instagram stories. Yes, I got food poisoning two days before my photo shoot. It was gnarly. Okay. It was not pretty. I Let me tell you, I <laughs> my photo shoot was Thursday. I had a poke bowl on Tuesday. We went out for this very nice dinner Tuesday night. Okay. Very nice. Like minimum three course dinner type of deal. Local seafood. It was phenomenal. I'm sitting at this dinner and I was actually, which is really funny. I was wearing my June day play suit in black. Okay. Which is super cute. It blocks EMF. It's cute enough to wear up to a fancy dinner, which I did. Juna Day specializes in EMF blocking clothing for women. Check it out again on my website. So I'm wearing this play suit and I'm sitting there, I'm talking to my husband, Ryan, and I'm like, we're going on and on. And I really felt like super bloated. And I was like, my stomach felt very hard. And you know what? I actually don't get bloated very often. I'm not somebody who I kind of know what to avoid so I don't get bloated. And I felt so bloated. I felt like I was pregnant. Literally, I was like, why does my stomach feel so hard? Feels like there's a rock in my stomach. Something is wrong. Like, I don't feel good. So we finished this really, really nice dinner. Go home. An hour later, I start puking. I felt like, so we fall asleep. Hour later, wake up, start puking. I puked four times that night. I had diarrhea. Like every everything came out of me everything. And if this is graphic, I don't know what to tell you. So that very expensive dinner that I paid for, I puked it up, (laughs) unfortunately. And I had food poisoning. I had a fever. I could not keep any solid food down. And it lasted two days. It is the first time I've actually had food poisoning for two days. Previous times when I've had food poisoning, it's only ever been 24 hours. So I had food poisoning in March in Costa Rica. I've had food poisoning in Tanzania, in Africa when I was there about five years ago. And I haven't really had it since, but again, I got it last week and yeah, I couldn't keep anything down. 
And it was interesting to, I posted this on my Instagram stories. I actually took a look at my aura ring results and the aura ring for those who don't know, basically is a sleep and activity tracker. And you should have seen my metrics. Okay. So my HRV, which is heart rate variability, I typically like it about 80 or above. It was 32. It was in the thirties, the nights that I had food poisoning. Okay. Those numbers is usually what I see when I drink alcohol. That's how that compares is like the alcohol is that bad for your heart that it drops your HRV that significantly that it's equal to when you have food poisoning. At least it is for myself. So very low HRV. I had a temperature spike, obviously with a fever and you get a fever because the body heats itself in order to kill the bacteria. That's kind of one of, one of that's the immune system activated. That's how it kills off the foreign invader so that you can be healthier in the future. So a fever is actually a good thing. It means your body's actually reacting appropriately and doing what it should in order to fight off what is happening on a cellular level. So I had a fever, low HRV and high heart rate. My heart rate, my RHR, which is resting heart rate was 58. And usually my heart rate's about 48 when I'm sleeping. So it was significantly higher for me anyway. And again, when you drink alcohol, you see this same thing, high heart rate, low HRV. And that's exactly what I had with food poisoning. So I was sick and the next day is so the Wednesday. I'm like, okay, I'm feeling a little better. It's going to be fine. I can probably eat something. So I eat a bit of solid food and I puked it up the next morning. And what I realized when I was researching online is like, the recommendation when you you when you have food poisoning is actually no solid food until you have a solid bowel movement which i had not and i didn't know that so that was dumb <laughs> on my behalf i shouldn't have done that but yeah i i got rid of yeah i was literally like water a little bit of coffee not much at all a lot of organic cold pressed juice I had a bit of kombucha and that's what I was. And then Thursday I had my photo shoot. So Thursday I was like, I haven't had solid food in two days. I've been puking. I have nothing in me, but I had the photographer. I had hair and makeup. I booked this Airbnb. So you better believe that I was showing up for that photo shoot 100% the best I could because to organize all of that again without the food poisoning, there was no way. There was no way. So I did it. I had my, I'm not going to lie. I had caffeine on the photo shoot day, even though it was dehydrating on the body, which you don't want to do when you have food poisoning. But when you have to show up for six hours and there's people like expecting you to be there, there was no choice. So I had my coffee, had my water and honestly, I got through it and it was fine. I wasn't nauseous. I just, my energy was just lower, but you know what? I, I got a sneak peek on some of the photos and I actually think it made a better photo shoot because I kind of gave zero Fs during it. There was less, oh, look at me. I'm like smiling and more just like, I'm going to make this cup of tea and you're taking photos. I'm like, okay, let's chill. And the photos actually look very natural because <laughs> I was a little bit out of it <laughs> the entire day. So who knows? Maybe it was meant to be, but I'm feeling better now. and. If you hear this or next time, food poisoning. So no solid food until you have a solid bowel movement, whether that is 24 hours or 48 hours, get your hands on cold pressed juice. I did a lot of citrus ones. So vitamin C focused, and I did a lot of ginger. So fresh pressed ginger in these juices. And then I also did a lot of ginger tea a lot of ginger tea. And that really helped my stomach. And then a lot of electrolytes as well. So something that can obviously be of concern when you have food poisoning is the electrolyte imbalance that can occur and you can become dehydrated. So a lot of electrolytes, even if it's just sea salt, adding that to your water, that can help anything like that. And that is my recommendation. And in relation to bioptimizers, which is how I started this rant, is when I started eating food again, I was using their digestive enzymes every meal 
just to kind of help ease into it again. And I also took their probiotics after as well, because it was really important to support the gut after going through that type of situation. And bioptimizers is always my go-to for this because they have the best on the market and I've been using them for over two years. And I actually don't touch any other probiotics or digestive enzymes. And when I tell you other brands have reached out to me and I say, no, like I I'm good. <laughs> I have my brand that I like and it works for me and my family. So I'm not changing. And so I, I stick to bioptimizers. So that's my little rant about having food poisoning when on vacation. Be careful out there <laughs> when you're having food. And you know, the thing with food poisoning is like, you never, you're never going to find out what it was, right? So it could be a piece of raw fish. It could be a piece of lettuce that has bad bacteria on it. You never know. Like you never know. My husband did not get sick at all. It was only me. So there's, there's nothing you can really do. And that's the thing with food poisoning too, is like, you just have to wait it out. There's nothing you can do other than hydrate yourself and sleep and take it easy as much as possible. And that's about it. Yeah. So Anyway, enjoy this podcast episode. This was so fun talking to Dr. Ron. He's such a light. He was just so easy to talk to and has so much experience. My gosh, so much experience. So we talk a lot about preventative health and optimizing health and children's health as well, actually. We talk a lot about biomarkers and different vitamin and mineral levels to get tested and really just how to really try to be as healthy as you can today for a healthier tomorrow. And he has a lot of insight. He has four children and we go through a lot of different things like that. So enjoy this podcast episode. Stay tuned for another two coming next week. I try to release podcasts every Tuesday and Friday. It doesn't always happen, but it typically does. So thank you for listening. And if you're not already, follow me on Instagram at Biohacking Brittany. That is where I am the most active, especially on stories and in DMs over there. If you're interested in becoming a client, join my wait list. It is up. It's been up for a few months. It's on my website. And yeah, message me if you have any questions about your health in the meantime, and I will be happy to help you. Welcome to Biohacking with Brittany. I am so thrilled that you are joining me this week for another episode. Welcome back to all of the weekly listeners that I have. And I am really excited about this one because we are diving into optimal health, but through a different lens as I have a medical doctor with me today, which is Dr. Ron Hanin Hockey. He goes by Dr. Ron for short, and he is the chief medical officer at the Reordin Clinic, which is an academic medical center that has been leading the world in integrative oncology and complex chronic illness care since 1975, which is very impressive. So Dr. Ron, welcome to the show. Brittany, thank you so much for having me on. Awesome. Can you kind of start us with a bit about your background and how you became so passionate about integrative medicine and optimal health? Well, I was a small town boy, got interested in running nutrition, meditation in college and thought, hey, let's go to medical school and I'll learn more about this new thing called wellness. And I'll just tell everyone ahead of time that when you go to medical school, you don't learn about health and wellness. You learn about disease and anatomy and, and a lot of really important stuff to be a doctor, but not so much about wellness. So that was a bit of a disappointment. And it took me about 10 years of going through postgraduate family practice training and whatnot until I finally ran into Dr. Reardon at a conference on gardening, healthy gardening. And he invited me down to have lunch with him and the rest is history. Wow. It's funny how like one meeting like that or meeting one single person can just like change your trajectory. Eh? It really is true. I mean, just about anything in your life, if you're not careful, can change your trajectory. So yeah. Yeah. 
Exactly. Um, something that I found interesting when I was kind of going through all of your information, your website and things like this, is you talk about uh, nutritional deficiencies. And I'm a nutritionist, so this is something that I'm very aware of for myself and when I was seeing clients. But you also talk about like the ones that are the most popular and ones that people might be facing in 2023. So that's like a very interesting take. What do you think are the most common ones that you're currently seeing this year? Well, keep in mind that we have a wonderful luxury here in that the Reardon Clinic was founded by Dr. Reardon, of course, and Olive W. Garvey, who was a very intelligent woman who was passionate about farming. And she wanted to get her grandchildren's nutrient levels checked because she knew that the soil was important for the the quality of the nutrition for the plants. She thought, well, let's we need to check my grandkids so that their health will be good. None of the doctors that she went through went to with them knew anything about checking nutrient levels until she ran into Dr. Reardon. And he offered, he was a psychiatrist, but he was in that early era of orthomolecular psychiatry where Linus Pauling Ewan Hoffer and a number of other doctors were starting to use large doses of nutrients to treat psych psychiatric illness, but they were doing that by measuring nutrient levels. They weren't just throwing out nutrients at people. They were actually looking at tests. Carl Pfeiffer had a laboratory. So Dr. Reardon started a laboratory here in Wichita. And so Based upon his measurements, that's where he kind of learned mostly how to pick and choose on the nutrients. Now, down the road, certain things became pretty clear, like Abram Hoffer was really big on niacin, and, and niacin is taking on a whole new role these days because it turns out to be crucial for NAD, which is a mitochondrial component. And if you don't have enough niacin, your mitochondria aren't going to work as well as they should. And so, so he used that in schizophrenics as well as in cancer patients. So Dr. Reardon, of course, was the big vitamin C guy because Linus Pauling did that initial work in cancer. So those are two really big ones that I still work a lot with. Zinc, of course, vitamin D. I'm a big fan of vitamin D since I spent about 15 years up in Canada on a board that completely devoted itself to research in vitamin D. And that's a phenomenal nutrient that most of us, we're, we become in, indoor dwellers and so we don't get enough sunshine. So we tend to be low in vitamin D. So, so those are some of the big ones. I love that. I am actually in Canada. I'm outside of Vancouver on the West Coast. Whereabouts in Canada were you? Let's see, we were in, let's see, I'm trying to think of more the middle part of it. So uh, that's all I can recall. <laughs> okay, that's fine. But yeah, the honestly, like vitamin D in general is a big concern for North America and especially Canada, just because of the lack of sunshine that we have here. What range do you typically recommend people take per day, um, let's say in the winter when there is a really big reduction in sunlight? Well, here's what I get into with patients. You know, there a lot of their doctors are very much afraid of vitamin D because even when I first started here at the Reardon Clinic, Dr. Reardon was still prescribing D2. And D2, if you get too much of it, it can cause, uh, you know, calcification issues. And so, and that's what most doctors have kind of, that's the information that's been handed down to them. But now with D3, especially when you combine it with D3K2, the likelihood of calcification is very, very small. I mean, I can normally keep people in the 70 range down here, and but I've had them up in the 120, 140 range, and I've yet to have anyone develop any kind of a calcification issue in the last 10, 15 years that I've been using the high doses. So I typically put people on 10,000 with a 100 of K2. Yeah. That's really interesting that you say that because I typically take between 5,000 and 10,000 IUs daily. And whenever I tell people that who aren't aware of the research or how significant of an issue it is, they always think I'm crazy. Like they just think, like you kind of said, like that's so much, you don't need to be taking that much. 
But then at the same time, I'm like, I live in Vancouver. It rains for like 30 days on end in March. Depression and like mood disorders and vitamin D plays such a crucial role in so many different things in the body that I'm not really concerned about overdosing through supplementation like that. We uh, were using during the worst of the pandemic, we were, I was putting many of my patients on 30,000 and, and with the accompanying K2. And again, we had no particular problems. By the way, I just have to put this in. If, if anyone out there has not gone to vitamin D wiki.com, are you familiar with that one? Brittany? No, no, I'm oh, not. You've got to go. It's got about, I think, 1400 page web pages of information on vitamin D, very well organized, 125 different conditions that respond to vitamin D. And in parentheses, after each condition, it tells you the number of, of studies that have been done to support that. For instance, in COVID, there are now 1,200 studies that vitamin D is, is a very important nutrient to be on if you want to avoid COVID. Right. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. I'm curious what you think about young babies taking vitamin D. And I ask because I just became an aunt recently and my niece was here visiting. She's six months old and her parents aren't, how do I say, like not optimally healthy, I guess. Like they're not like me or, and they're not in the health space and not that I'm any better or anything like, like that. I'm just saying where we work in different spaces and their baby is obviously on vitamin D and they're very strict with it but them themselves aren't on vitamin D. They don't take any supplements. Like they don't really care that much, but because their medical doctor was like, Hey, your baby has to be on vitamin D. They are like, they're pretty adamant about it, which is great to see. So I'm curious, how much do you think a baby should be taking? Because I don't think that they can synthesize vitamin D, even if they are exposed to the right. Is she nursing? Do you know if she's nursing or not? Or yeah, she's breastfeeding. Yeah. That would help. No, I, I, you know, a, a rule of thumb that I used was for every year of age, they should be on 1000 of D and then 10 of K2. But I think you could go higher than that quite safely. Yeah. Oh, that's a really good rule of thumb. I'm actually going to write that down. Yeah. That's really interesting. Cause I, yeah, I bet people just kind of taper off as kids get older. And again, like don't really follow through with making sure that they're on top of it. Well, especially since kids are don't play outside as much as they used to. It's now video games and stuff indoors. And, you know, if they're getting plenty of sunshine, they're probably okay. But the further north you are, the less likely they're going to get adequate amounts. Yeah. Yeah. I just heard a statistic actually that said, I think it's, we spend less than 7% of our entire lives outdoors now. So right. 93% of our lives are inside. Exactly. And that is... I don't even know how to understand that statistic. That's staggering. Like that's nothing. That's in the grand scheme of things. That's really nothing. Yeah. I'm in my early seventies and I can just remember growing up as a kid, we were outdoors playing all the time because of course there wasn't TV and there wasn't a lot of other things. We wanted to be outdoors. Now there are so many other distractions that are keeping kids indoors. I know. Yeah. It's a big issue. And as I approach this fertility portion of my life coming up. I'm, I think about this a lot because you want your kids to be able to get the skills that are going to be relevant to the workplace, right? Like understand technology and stuff like that. But at the same time, I really want them to be outside and gardening and like understanding how vegetables grow and putting their hands in the dirt. And it's like, it just feels like an uphill battle, to be honest, to be like a quote unquote, like super healthy parent in today's day and age. Are you concerned about EMF or radiation? Are you a woman in the health and wellness and biohacking space? And you're just looking for cute clothing that blocks radiation. Maybe you are pregnant. Maybe you're trying to get pregnant. Maybe you're postpartum, or maybe you just really want to block your body from harmful frequencies that you are constantly bombarded with in our society these days. Finally, we actually have a cute solution <laughs> by a company called Juna Day. This is my friend's company, and I am so excited to be working with them. It's essentially airplane mode for your wardrobe. If you're flying, if you're working in the city, 
if you are sensitive to EMF, this is the clothing that you need. It is so cute. I have the play suit in black. I wear it at least once a week because it's just so comfortable. And it just blocks all of the 5G that's around me, the Wi-Fi, everything else that we're constantly exposed to. As somebody who is on her preconception journey, soon to be fertility journey, it's really important for me to block my, you know, to be honest, my ovaries from this type of thing. I want to protect my mitochondria. I want to protect my body in general from all of the frequencies. So this is what I'm wearing. And if you are sensitive in any way or worried in any way about EMF, you need this. Check out Juna Day. They have a bunch of different, really, really cute designs. So they have a belly band, which is if you're pregnant, you can just wear it underneath your clothing. They have a unitard, which is cute. They also have maternity legging. They have a play suit, which is what I have. And then they also have a body suit, which I kind of want as well, because you can wear it under anything made for all day wear. This clothing is so adorable. Definitely check it out by June a day. Use my discount code, Brittany in all capitals. It will get you 10% off. And please tag me if you wear this because someone tagged me the other day. She's pregnant. She's wearing the play suit and it was so cute. I'm so happy for her. So tag me if you wear it. I want to see it. And I'm just so happy and excited that we have another female founded company and brand in the biohacking space. It's so needed. So please go support this company, Judah Day. Yeah, I think if parents realize that children are watching everything they do, and if whatever we want our children to do, we should try to model it as best we can. And that's a good rule of thumb. Even then, the school factors, television factors, there's a bunch of other influences that are leading the way kids think. But I still think parents have a dominant role if they'll take it. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I don't know if you see a lot of children in your practice, but just kind of like while we're on this topic, have you seen any trends or issues kind of with children's health in the last five, 10 years that have kind of surprised you compared to maybe where things were before that? Well, I don't see a lot of children in my practice, but my wife just retired as a second grade teacher. So I hear a lot about kids and their stomach aches and their headaches and all the medicines that they're on and the inhalers and the allergies. And boy, kids these days are not in really good shape. They're, they have attention deficit problems all of which could be managed with careful control of their nutrition. But unfortunately, it's all fast foods, it's snacks, it's packaged foods. And we're, now we're seeing a lot of childhood obesity. The polyunsaturated fats are rampant in restaurant foods. Like I won't name the name, but of the common hamburger joints that people go to, all these factors and the incredible amount of sugar all of these factors are making our kids very, very ill. And then when they can't pay attention or when they're having problems, they are being medicated. And so kids are on more medicine and more inhalers and more stuff like that than ever there used to be. So this is just a huge cry for parents getting back in the game of making sure their kids are getting good nutrition, good exercise, good sleep, good parenting. Yeah, I that makes a lot of sense. For the people listening who have kids or maybe they're about to have kids, what would you recommend? Do you think that nutrition is the biggest factor here and for like in terms of optimal health for kids? Do you think it's more lifestyle and spending time outdoors or sleep? And I know it's easy to say like everything matters, but if there was like one thing that they could kind of maybe try to work on, like what would you say that would be? Well, I, you know, we deal with a lot of cancer patients here and I give them six things that I think I hadn't ever thought about this, but I think this plays into the care of children as well. The number one thing is connectivity. We are so disconnected. Yeah, we're connected electronically, but connected to other kids, connected to parents, connected to grandparents, to their siblings, just and that sense of belonging instead of being isolated, that is huge. And having support from parents and family, that's a big one. Stress management, if you can help kids learn to handle stress better. Sleep, number three, 
get your kids to bed on time and let them have a good night's sleep because that even with cancer patients, sleep is huge. Why We Sleep is a very important book looking at all the reasons why sleep is important, especially for kids who are growing. Then comes exercise, got to get plenty of exercise. And a lot of kids are doing well if they're in organized sports, but just to go out and just have fun and move, move around, that that's a good thing. Then comes nutrition. You'd think nutrition would be near the top, but really if you do all those other things, nutrition kind of fits in fairly naturally if, if parents are savvy about taking good care of their kids and then avoiding environmental toxins, just having kids become aware of the various types of poisons that exist underneath the sink or out in the garage or stuff that you've been using on the lawn, all those types of things if kids can st steer clear of that, that would be great. So those are the mix of six that I tell people to think about in terms of staying healthy for themselves and for their families. Yeah. I love that you said that. It's interesting. I'm doing a preconception cleanse right now, me and my husband, and it's six things. And I'm pretty sure it's all six things that you mentioned. The supplements also in there. But it's pretty, I don't want to say it's rigid, but it is a bit more rigid because it's like for about hundred days type of idea. And it's anyway, but it makes me think a lot about this of like, okay, how do we take these principles of a healthy lifestyle and apply it to ch childhood without it being like rules and super strict for kids to follow, but also like, Hey, we actually do need some boundaries in place so that you can grow up as healthy as you can. And you can't just let kids kind of have a free for all because, you know, it's going to end up just being TV and processed food every single day for a while. So I think it's tough out there. And yeah, I could have all the parents who are doing the best they can. So it's a tricky world to live in. But if parents keep in mind that children are watching them very closely. And so anything that you do as a parent, they're going to pretty much value that and and probably do that unless they have some strong outside influences but generally speaking if you do if you model for them what you want them to be they'll become that i think that's been true for our kids we never really pushed anything on our kids but there's that saying you know i was hearing what you were saying but i was really listening to what you were doing i love that yeah. That's, I actually love that a lot. That's really interesting. I find that even in my own family, it's very much like that. Like I, in the beginning, when I was starting my optimal health journey, let's say 10, 12 years ago, I would constantly try to be educating my parents and my brothers and my you know husband and people around me. And it didn't really work. <laughs> but then over the years, people just kind of started asking me questions and saw what I was doing. And so I just kind of led by example, instead of being like, oh, you shouldn't eat that. That has X, Y, and Z in it. It was more of like, oh, I'm going to eat this instead. And then people are like, oh, why? Like, why aren't you having that? And then it's an opportunity for education. So leading by example, like you said, I think it's just such a powerful tool to master if you can. That's the best way. I agree totally with you. You, If you try to coerce or convince or push people, they will back away. You know, they need to discover it for themselves. That's why our new patients, we call our new patient program, Real Health Discovery. That what is real health? It's going to be different for different people, but we facilitate that with the use of our laboratory and helping them actually see their nutrient levels. When you do a complete panel of nutrient levels, sometimes patients are shocked. But there's research out there that people will respond to information better than they will some expert telling them what to do. And that's why all the, like, for example, I'm doing continuous glucose monitoring. Do I have diabetes? No, but I have found that has profoundly changed my understanding of how foods are affecting my blood sugar, my sleep, my energy level. And I'm changing my diet even more, not because I've read it in a book, but because I can see what certain foods do to my, my blood sugar level. And so, and when I go to bed and how well I sleep and stuff like that. So personal information can be a very powerful motivator. My next partner I want to talk about is Athletic Greens. So I take AG1 by Athletic Greens literally every single day. And I first gave AG1 a try when I was traveling to Costa Rica. 
I really wanted something to support my gut health, boost my energy, keep my immune system in check, and really just support me while I was traveling and not home. I quickly fell in love with it. And now that I'm back in Canada, I still take it every single day. And I take it in the morning before I have any type of coffee. Typically, it's like the first thing I have in the morning. And it makes me feel just fantastic. I feel like I'm starting my day off on the right foot. I feel like I'm covering all of my nutrition needs right from the get-go, which is super important and such a healthier way to start than just having coffee on an empty stomach right away. So I just, I'm just obsessed with taking it. And if you want to take ownership of your health, today is a good time to start. Athletic Greens is giving you a free, wow, (laughs) one year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. So those are the same travel packs that I took when I was flying. Go to athleticgreens.com slash biohacking with Brittany. That's athleticgreens.com slash biohacking with Brittany to check it out today. It's also linked in my show notes and on my website everywhere. That's very biohacky of you (laughs) (laughs) to do that. (laughs) I would only do it for a month or two. It's a little bit expensive, but I just can't stop doing it because I've learned so much from it that you can't read in a book because in a way you can test out different foods, different food combinations and see how it affects your own blood sugar, how stress affects it, how sleep affects it. There's just so many variables in that blood sugar turns out to be a kind of a natural feedback loop in terms of just how well you're doing. Yeah. I love that. I haven't tried a CGM yet. It's not as accessible in Canada as it is in the U S but it is something on my radar for when it becomes more of a, I guess like consumable average, I I forget the word I'm trying to say, but like the average person can get it. Right. But you know, I actually, when I was talking about CGMs on my Instagram a while ago, I actually got some criticism about it. And I'm curious what you think about this because there's people who medically need CGMs, like if they are diabetic, obviously. And those people tend to criticize the fact that it's becoming kind of like a fad or a trend that people are using these devices to optimize their health when they are not pre-diabetic. So when you hear criticism like that, what do you think? Do you think it's appropriate for us to be using this technology if we can get our hands on it? Anything that helps people make better decisions about their own health and avoid future illness, that's one of the most valuable things you can do. I mean, I don't know what these people are thinking because we live in a world where the health of the general populations are just diving. They're just, I mean, they're, we are seeing obesity numbers, diabetes numbers, cancer numbers, depression and mental illness. All this stuff is just exploding. And so if someone can wear a CGM and learn how to take better care of themselves, what better use would that be? Now, granted, if they're sick, yeah, that's great too. Let them have it too. But that should be no reason why people's shouldn't wear a CGM. I, I'm all, I'm in favor of personal information all the way. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with you. I think if you have access to it and you can afford it, you might as well. Again, if I had access to it and it was easier for me in Canada, I would definitely be doing it. The company that I like that does it is Levels. I'm not sure if that's the one that you have. I'm in. I'm in Levels Health. Nice. Oh. Yeah. Nice. That's. I'm and waiting for that. Good information on their website and feedback and just, you know, helping a person learn how to take better care of themselves. That's my mantra. Learn how to take better care of yourself because if you don't do it, no one's going to do it for you. Exactly. I'm curious that you work with a lot of like diabetes patients and pre-diabetes. So I've had my blood tested multiple times for, let's see, my fasting insulin, fasting glucose and HbA1c. That's the one that's over 90 days, right? Yes. Okay. So I know my levels pretty well. Actually, I could just pull them up, but I've always kind of been out of the pre-diabetes range and I'm very thankful for that. But I've had my husband checked a few times and sometimes he's like creeping up on the pre-diabetes range and I'm not super stoked about it. So what is like the prevalence of pre-diabetes in society today? And like, how often are you kind of seeing this? 
huge. I personally like the fasting insulin. Hemoglobin A1C is fine, but the fasting glucose can vary depending upon what you've eaten in the day before or leading up to that fasting glucose. So I really like the fasting insulin as a marker for whether or not you're becoming pre-diabetic, insulin resistant. So I try to keep, personally, I try to keep my fasting insulin level below four, and it usually is in the one to two range. And so, but that's being, you know, overly cautious just because I've, well, I come from a family of diabetics. And so I'm just being aware of taking care of myself. And plus so many things in terms of chronic illnesses come from poor blood sugar control. The weight issue is is obviously exploding all over the planet. And it's partly because of the polyunsaturated fats and partly because of the refined sugars that are so prevalent and the non-foods that people are eating and the lack of exercise and probably all these different things, stress, all of this tends to destabilize the homeostasis of the body. And one way to get an idea of how stable your homeostasis is is, is to monitor your your blood sugar. Because if you get upset, if you don't get enough sleep, if you drink too much alcohol, all these things will destabilize your blood sugar because it responds to adrenaline and things like that. So I think it's, once again, we're back to a simple, relatively low cost tool to help the multitude take more responsibility for their own health and well being. Yeah. So I just pulled out my results. I'm just curious what you think. So for let's start with HbA1c. So this for people listening is a percentage. It's over the last 90 days before you get your blood tested. So it's an average. So what is your optimal result that you like to see for HbA1c? What is your what is your range up there? So mine my, through this I get tested through inside tracker. So through this it says the normal range is between 3 to 5.7%. 3 to 5.7 percent. Yeah. So it's a little different than ours. But again, I try to keep people in the range is for hemoglobin A1C. So many people are just, they're either, they're toying with being high or after a while, I think people give up and they don't care what their weight is. They don't care what they eat. Then they'll start to get into the six, 6.5. But if you keep it in the five range, that's pretty good. You can certainly you can do better than that. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. So mine is five, like 5.0. The lowest I've ever seen it is 4.9 and I've tested for multiple years. And so, um, and the highest I've seen it is 5.2, but I I really like it to be (laughs) five. I don't know if I, I don't know what I would need to do, honestly, to make it lower than 4.9. You would have to go into ketosis, working on the ketogenic. I favor, rather than doing the ketogenic diet, I'm probably personally favoring if people would would do just two meals a day and just get that intermittent fasting seems to me to be more natural. I think our ancestors, they didn't start out the day with a big breakfast. They had to go out and gather their food. So I like the idea of intermittent fasting. It doesn't work for everyone. But it's, I think it's a little bit better, you know, the ketogenic diet, it's, it, I think it's appropriate for some people, but it may have been oversold quite honestly. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that, especially for women just with hormone balancing and your right. menstrual cycle and stuff like that. And then, so for glucose, the normal range, according to Inside Tracker, is 65 to 99 mg per DL. Is that correct? That is. Okay. And then when I got tested, oh, let me see what my last test was. It was 72. Oh, that's really good. Okay. Yeah. Good. Great. <laughs> and then I think it's always been about that. I think the highest it's been is 83, 72, 72, 74. Yeah. Even two years ago, it was, yeah. No, that's that one of the Dr. Reardon's things was don't ever recommend anything to a patient that you're not willing to do yourself in terms of your own health. And so if you're trying all this stuff on your own, and of course you're working with clients, but I'm working with patients who are coming in with fairly severe chronic illnesses. And so I, I try to model everything I'm asking them to do. Well, again, it goes back to that like idea of you being the example, right? And so if you're inspiring 
and you're doing it for yourself, like your clients and your patients are really, really going to value that. Exactly. Yeah. I'm curious about your expertise in brain health and microglial function, which is like the immune cells in the brain, correct? Yes. I did a really, and I just reviewed it not too long ago. If, if people would go on YouTube, uh, Reardon Clinic, and type in microglia madness, that was a short lecture that I did. It was only about a 30-minute lecture, but I went back and reviewed it recently, and it really hits a lot of important points in terms of our changing understanding of what brain health is. It used to be we thought that brain health had to do just with the neurotransmitters being balanced. But now, even at Harvard, there's a Dr. Palmer that's written a book called Brain Energy, where he says uh, mental health is metabolic in its essence. Brain, brain health is metabolic in essence because, a, this is shocking, a typical neuron, they used to say, has 100,000 mitochondria per neuron, which I think, wow, that's a lot. Well, now they're saying it's one to two million per neuron. That's how imp incredibly our brains just require so much energy. 20% of what we use energy-wise is used by the brain, even though it's only four to 5% of what our, our body constitutes constitution is. And so, so people need to get the notion that if they want to feel good, think good, remember good, take, take good care of your brain. And the way you do that is to get metabolically healthy. Hello, it's Brittany here, and I've got something life-changing to share with you. Sleep is crucial for our productivity, well-being, and beauty, right? No one wants to wake up with dehydration lines and dark circles. That has definitely happened to me. Picture this, you wake up feeling refreshed, your skin is glowing, yes, get it, and those pesky dehydration lines and dark circles, they're nowhere in sight. Sounds like a dream, right? Well, I'm here to tell you that it's not only possible, but it's also within your reach. I used to struggle with falling asleep. There was a time when getting a good night's sleep felt like chasing unicorns, tossing and turning, waking up multiple times, and feeling like a zombie the next day. Seriously, that happened to me for a long time until about 2019, 2020, when I started biohacking my sleep. But then recently it started happening again, and I actually uncovered the ultimate secret that's really been helping me, and that is magnesium breakthrough. It has completely transformed my sleep and got me sleeping so good again. So what's important to know is that not all magnesium supplements are created equal, so don't waste your time with over-the-counter options. Magnesium Breakthrough is the real deal. It combines seven different forms of magnesium in a single capsule, giving you the full-spectrum magnesium experience you need for optimal results. So here's my nightly routine that I've been doing. I take two capsules of Magnesium Breakthrough with water about an hour before bed. The effects are remarkable. I drift off faster and enjoy deeper, more rejuvenating sleep. And then when the morning comes, I wake up feeling refreshed, energized, and ready to conquer the day. And I wake up at 5 a.m., so I'm not messing around, okay? I need my good sleep. So say goodbye to restless nights and tired mornings and unlock your best sleep with Magnesium Breakthrough. Ready for my offer? Visit magbreakthrough.com slash biohackingbrittany and enter the code biohackingbrittany for a discount. We love discounts. Remember, this offer is only available on this special website. So if you go to Bioptimizer's normal website, it's not going to happen. It's not there. So don't let sleepless nights hold you back any longer. That's magbreakthrough.com slash biohackingbrittany. Use my discount code biohackingbrittany to save. Woo -woo and let me know how your sleep is going. That's very interesting. That is the first time that I've heard that in terms of how dense the neurons are with mitochondria, because what I've heard, and it's probably because of the circles that I'm in, is like the cells in the ovaries actually are the most mitochondria dense. And I've been told it's like about 100,000 mitochondria per cell in the ovaries, which makes sense, right? Like that's where we give life. I and that too. And that's why I, I, that's why I, but until just this, it's only been in the last 10 years that the scientists have really been studying the microglial issue because that's an autoimmune disease of the brain. And your microglia, if they get, 
whacked out for whatever reason, toxins, stress, all these concussions, those kinds of things, they start actually attacking your own brain and causing mental illness. So if people would want to watch that little video, it's really a nice summary of the new research. There's actually in the last 10 years, I looked this up, there have been 186,000 studies on the microglia because they're really looking at this as the new paradigm of understanding mental illness. Wow. What is the name of the autoimmune condition when the brain attacks itself? Well, that it doesn't really have a name at this point because they, most doctors don't think of the brain being an immune autoimmune thing because they've often thought the immune system is separate from the brain's autoimmune system. There probably is some there. I'm, I'm not going to, I'm going to just plead ignorance here. There may be some name for that, but I, I don't know it. Yeah, that's really interesting because, again, I haven't heard this before, so I was just going to write it down and, and look it up. I know a little bit. It might yeah. be mental illness, schizophrenia, depression, anxiety, bipolar. They, you know, if you look at, at psychology or psychiatry, those are just empirical names. They do not really reflect what's going on in the brain organ. And that's why this book on brain energy is such a breakthrough, because he's basically saying now we can start looking at functional explanations for why people are schizophrenic. Dr. Abram Hoffer, his, he cured over five, he's a good Canadian, he cured over 5,000 schizophrenics in his lifetime using high doses of niacin. And people say, well, how could a B vitamin do that? Well, it's the precursor to NAD, which is a very important part of a healthy functioning mitochondria. So he was restoring mitochondrial functioning in schizophrenics and they were becoming healthy again. Wow. Yeah. That's very interesting to hear. Would this relate to Alzheimer's at all? Or do you think that that is a separate pathology, I guess? Well, th there's a lot of controversy is exactly what's causing it. But again, a lot is being looked at in terms of the metabolic dysfunction. And so one of the kind of like the, I don't know if it's a trend or just a, a, a kind of interest in a lot of people is something called methylene blue. And so methylene blue is a actually a dye, but it can be combined with vitamin C, which makes it more fat soluble. And it gets into the brain and is very good for mitochondrial functioning. So they're using that for Alzheimer's and a number of other brain conditions. Oh, and interesting. It's considered a nootropic. If you know the word nootropic, meaning something that helps the brain function better, methylene blue does that. But I recommend using it in conjunction with vitamin C and niacin and some of these other basic nutrients. It's not a nutrient, but it's a very powerful antioxidant and electron donor. Interesting. Yeah, I actually have some. It's in my fridge. <laughs> I got given a sample of it. And so I've, I haven't used it yet because I wasn't sure when to use it, how to use it, when to take it type of thing. But maybe I will actually look into it now that you're saying this and how it can just really be supportive of brain health in general. Yes. We have Dr. Thomas Levy and I did a podcast. If, if anyone's ever wants to go to Reardon Clinic and look at our real health podcasts. There's, and we had more responses to that than any other podcast that we've done. So people are interested in methylene blue. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's one of those things that it's not super common yet. And so when people hear about it, they get really excited about it. And obviously like, I think it turns your tongue blue, right? Well, I tell people, this is, I was a chemistry major in college. And if you mix, if you mix ascorbic acid, vitamin C, not sodium ascorbate, but vitamin C in warm water and put your drops of methylene blue in it. The methylene blue is oxidized, but it will steal, an, it'll, or I should say vitamin C will donate an electron to it and it'll turn it from that dark blue into a very light turquoise and it won't stain at that in that state. And so that's called leucomethylene blue. It's a different molecule based upon the use of using vitamin C to donate an electron to it. Interesting. Okay. I'm going to look that up and try that because I have both of those ingredients here in my house and I'm curious about it. With the, the autoimmune, just back to that for a second, is it true, or maybe like you found this in your own experience that if you are 
susceptible, if you have one autoimmune condition, it makes you susceptible to all other autoimmune conditions? Well, let's go back to what is the fundamental cause of autoimmune disease. And more and more people are thinking it's leaky gut, the leaky gut syndrome. And so, yes, if you've got one autoimmune thing and you still got the leaky gut, you're going to have two or three other ones down the road. So that's why we are really emphasizing different things to help people heal the gut. Because if you can heal the gut, so many things start to get better. Yeah. What are your favorite recommendations for leaky gut syndrome? There's a product called Perfect Amino that we uh, I, we certainly didn't find out about it till, actually I heard about it 10 years ago, but I didn't really get the full scoop on it till re- recently. And that's one of our podcasts. But the thing is, is there are 22 amino acids. There are nine and some people say 10 that are essential. Perfect Amino has the nine essential amino acids in a perfect ratio that's been studied such that all the other amino acids can be synthesized from these nine. And so if you take this on an empty stomach, if you have any lack of enzymes or if you have damaged endothelial lining of your gut, this will repair it. So if you can repair your gut, that's going to help you avoid so many chronic illnesses down the road. So I take my perfect amino every morning and and I think it really has quieted down my digestive system and made me less prone to other problems. You know that I am a big believer in intermittent fasting, no matter the age, no matter the gender. However, it is trickier for women, mostly because of the impact it has on our hormones and our menstrual cycle. And honestly, a lot of the time it can just be too stressful for us to be fasting every single day. And it can really cause menstrual irregularities, PMS symptoms, and all sorts of things like that. So I'm really excited to be taking and eating the new intermittent fasting bars made by Prolon. So this is a really cool idea. I have yet to see another company do this and I've yet to see anybody even execute it somewhat well like Prolon. So based on the science of the Prolon fasting mimicking diet that keeps your body in a fasted state, even though the body is being nourished, The intermittent fasting bar is the first bar scientifically developed and tested to not break your fast. This combination of good fats from nuts and selected macro and micronutrients provides nourishment so you can feel fuller for longer and conquer your cravings while you fast. Eat in the morning after your overnight fasting period to achieve your intermittent fasting goals. Guys, that is amazing. I'm just like so impressed that they even came up with this idea that these are even effective. And I am obsessed because now I can take and eat one of these bars in the morning, not worry about breaking my fast, not worry about spiking my blood glucose or my ketones and still be nourishing my body without causing too much stress on it. And you know what? You know, these bars are successful in a hit when they are always sold out on their website. Like I just tried to order more and they were sold out again. So that says a lot about how much people are loving these and really, really enjoying them. Actually, if you go to their website, they have a couple of graphs as well that kind of show what it is, what it looks like Uh, glucose wise and ketone wise when you fast with water versus fasting and eating one of these bars in the morning. And there's no difference. So you can go check out the signs yourself, go believe it, go read it, and definitely try these out. There's three flavors. There's chocolate chip, nuts and honey, and coconut macadamia. I like coconut macadamia the best, but you can definitely buy a variety pack and try them out yourselves. So go to the link, link to my show notes and on my website by Prolon and use my discount code biohackingbrittany in all capitals to save on these bars. You definitely want to use my discount code. These bars are not super cheap, but they are worth it because they are so good for you and they don't cause any hormonal disruption. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I take, I take amino acids every day, but I don't take a perfect amino, this brand that you're talking about. And I'm actually going to take a look at the one that I'm taking versus the one that you recommended and the ratios of it just to compare 
Yeah, because I'm just curious kind of like what's on the market versus like this perfect balance of all the different amino acids. Yeah, listen to episode 59, which is the episode where it's called The Importance of Amino Acids. It's a it's very, that my guest was excellent. And so that'll kind of, it's David Min, Minkow. And he is, he'd be a great one to get on your show, I'll tell you, because he, he's run 43 Ironman in his life. And he's still He's in his mid seventies, but he he claims a lot of this is due get, to getting these amino acids, which can repair damage within his body. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, I will definitely take a look at that. For the people listening, who kind of like myself sometimes, and I guess a lot of people are overworked or don't have a lot of work life balance. Sometimes maybe they have kids, maybe they don't. What do you think? is I know we kind of talked about it for kids and you have these like six things, but what can people really do when they're kind of just stuck in the grind and they're not able to unplug and their work is maybe just so demanding? Like how can they, I guess like, how can you make little steps towards optimal health every day, you know, without it feeling like this big, large thing that you have to invest into time, money, all of the things like that? That is the key question of, of the day. <laughs> I encourage people to think about people they've known who've gotten sick and how their illness totally disrupted their lives. And people who are living like this, they're on the edge of getting sick. Matter of fact, I think the body gets sick kind of on purpose to kind of pull us out of a situation like what you just described. But why wait until you get sick? Why don't you just start making one new decision a day or a week and then stick with it. It could be just going out and walking every morning. Or for me, a big one after I started doing the blood sugar readings was to get to bed every night between nine and nine 30. That was hard because I'm so, I kind of like being up. But then when I found out that getting up early, that was a good time for me to meditate, to, to think, and so once you start one thing, then that will oftentimes turn into two good things. And then those will turn into three good things. But you have to start one thing that makes a big difference in terms of your health. And what that is, it's got to be your own choice. Exercise is good for a lot of people changing your diet. I think going to bed on time is a really good one because people think they can stay up all night. And the new research on sleep is incredibly important in terms of your overall health. And so I would probably say that would be one of the best things people could do. Yeah, I loved what you touched upon thinking about like people around you who've gotten sick. I think a big thing for me is motivation. And I've seen my parents both go through different illnesses, different times of their lives. And I know that the choices that I make today will actually impact me in 10 years, 15, 20 years. And so that's like one of my biggest motivators is I don't want to be when I'm older one day and retired and relying on a bunch of pharmaceutical drugs and not being able to touch my toes. And you know what I mean? Like having this life that so many people deal with. And I just feel like the little effort that I put in every single day now will be beneficial when I'm older, when it's harder to kind of be in that optimal, healthy place. Yeah, no, I, I that's actually really, I think that's a very good way to look at it. And it's really just saying that there was a, a neat little book called A Minute for Myself. And that the whole essence of the book was where you ask yourself at any time during the day, what can I do right now to take better care of myself? And what you did is what can I do to take better care of my life? What can I do to take better care of my kids? Just asking that question and then don't try to think it out. Just step back and let that kind of divine quality within you show itself and then listen to that inner voice that says, you better get to bed on time or whatever it is that it says, but it's going to be personal for each different person. But if, if they know it's coming from themselves and from their own hearts, then they're going to be much more likely to follow it than someone wagging a figure at them and said, saying, you know, you better change. That's not going to work. It's got to come from within. Yeah, exactly. I think everyone's has a different personal motivations and reasons for doing it. My, like I said, like mine is almost like preventative. Like I want to prevent these issues coming down the road. And then my other thing as well is like, I see all around me every single day, what it 
means to not do what I do and the results that people have. And I don't want to be like everybody else in society (laughs) who's unhealthy. So why would I do what they're doing? You know what I mean? Like, it's very obvious that sitting all day and eating processed food and drinking a lot of alcohol and blah, 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 all these things leads to unfather like unfavorable circumstances. So why would I make those decisions that they make and copy other people? Health is extremely logical. If people would just sit down and think about the investments that they're making in their lives, if they would just see how incredibly uh, important health is, and you never, a lot of people never get it until they get really sick. And then they say, gosh, why didn't I think about this? Why didn't I prioritize this? Do it now. Prioritize it now. Yeah, exactly. No, that's it. That's you, you either pay for it. I guess you pay for a little bit now. I think there's a quote actually that says something about that. You know, you pay a little bit now every single day, or you pay a lot in the future when, you know, sickness ends up coming and then it does disrupt your whole life. And then you do have these larger medical bills, or maybe you can't work, or maybe it impacts your relationships and the things that you can do in life. And so Yeah, but it's really personal, but I love what you said. It actually is pretty logical. I think we all kind of know what we need to be doing. We just kind of have to stick to it. Yeah. Pay me now or pay me later more. Yes. Because (laughs) now is going to always be a a lower investment, even though it seems hard on the front end, it's going to be a lot more if you let yourself get really sick. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. If people want to connect with you and potentially work with you or listen to your podcast or do anything like that, where can they go and how can they do that? We Reardon Clinic and it's R-I-O-R-D-A-N clinic.org. We're a nonprofit organization. That's We've got a really good website. And then we all of our newsletters, they can download those free. We've got the podcasts that are good. We've got all of our scientific research. We didn't even touch very much on our IV vitamin C research for cancer and nat- the natural approaches to cancer. But we do, we have a lot of that on our website. So there's a lot there if people are interested. Amazing. I will put that in the show notes so everybody can find you. Thank you so much for coming on my podcast. This was awesome. One more thing, Brittany. Yeah. I just remembered I spent the, that all that time up in Calgary, Alberta. Ah, there you go. Where where I did a we did a lot of board meetings and whatnot and a lot of research on vitamin D. So that vitamin D thing, if people want to go away with one thing from this show. Make sure you're taking enough vitamin D. Wouldn't you agree with that? Yes, absolutely. I actually have my little vitamin D bottle right in front of me, D3 and K2, and I'm going to take it after this. (laughs) Hey, thank you for what you're doing to get more people interested in taking better care of themselves, Brittany. You're a good model for this. Uh, Thank you so much. All right. Take care. Thanks for listening to another episode of Biohacking with Brittany. If you're interested in finding the show notes or the sponsors for this episode, you can do so on my website, which is biohackingbrittany.com. Remember to follow me on Instagram where I'm most active. My handle is at biohackingbrittany. And if you're interested in working together and you want to email me directly, you can do that. My email is info at biohackingbrittany.com. And I look forward to hearing from you and having you tune in next week.